Thank you very much. And uh, let's start now the meetup. So our speaker is Amelia. She is a member of Data Science LA. I also organized with her uh, and a few others the user conference. So we know pretty much each other. <laughs> she's a PhD student at uh, UCLA, and she's going to have a great talk about uh, the I.O. conference she attended a few months ago. So let's work on Amelia. Okay, let's see if I can get this thing up again. Okay, so by show of hands, can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to not use the microphone because um, I am not very good at that sort of thing. Um, so like Szilard said, I'm Amelia McNamara. I'm getting my PhD in statistics at UCLA, and I'm really interested in data visualization, statistics education, um, statistics computing, and where all those things come together. Uh, so my PhD is on tools for novices to use when they're learning data analysis. I'm developing like some experimental interfaces to see if they help people develop better statistical intuition. Um, and so as a result, the IO Festival is really sort of in the intersection of my interests and I know that not everyone gets to go to it so um, I'm going to sort of give you some of the highlights from this year's festival. Um, you'll see up on the screen that's my IO badge and it's got my Twitter handle Amelia MN um, so feel free to tweet at me or follow me. I'm going to post the link to these slides after the fact. Um, they have like some notes and links in case you want to follow up on anything that I'm talking about. And um, if Szilard hasn't already convinced you that you should be tweeting and hashtagging DSLA, I think that this talk is going to convince you of that because basically every speaker at IO tweets and a bunch of the images that I'm going to use in this presentation came from Twitter. Um, you'll see a little attribution for any, any tweet um, that I took a photo from, but it's just that's part of the culture of the, of the festival. So what is IO? Um, it's this three-day festival. It takes place every year in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, it's focused on sort of art, code, data, physical computing, um, interaction, design, visual design, graphic design, that kind of thing, um, and then intersections between all those um, disciplines as well as people who think critically about those disciplines. And I tell people that it's more like a rock concert than it is like a conference. Um, the tickets sell out in like 20 minutes when they put them online, even though they cost almost $600, um, and they let a thousand people come. So that's what I'm saying, like not everyone gets to go. It's You're kind of sitting there at your computer with your finger on the button trying to um, get a ticket and then it's a really nicely produced conference so think more like a TED talk than some nerd like fumbling around with their laptop and doing what I just did trying to get the projector to work so um, like I said, it's it's three days. They have this um, schedule. I'm just showing you a little bit of it here. Basically, there's always two parallel sessions going on. So that's another way that it's not like a usual conference. You only have to make really one choice. It's like a coin flip. Um, but it's funny because that doesn't actually make it easier to choose. So every time I wanted to see both of the talks and I was only able to choose one and so as a result um, you might see someone on the schedule and you think why didn't she talk about them in her highlights talk I probably didn't get to see it um, and the other detail is this year I was volunteering at IO they have student volunteer positions which I'd really encourage you to apply for if you're a student you get to go for free and you get to sort of interact more one-on-one -on -one with the presenters who are really cool so sometimes I had volunteer duties that didn't allow me to go to talks. Um, another thing that makes it sort of more like a, a rock concert or something than a conference is that they do these opening titles every year. Um, and because I don't have time to tell you all the people that speak, I'm just going to play you the titles so that you can see. Um, but they get a design house to do these beautiful titles. And they have sound, although I'm not hearing any sound. Um, so Paola Antonelli is the curator at MoMA um, for digital artifacts. Mike Bostock, of course, is the D3 guy. Um, I don't know everyone. K 
Kate Crawford is a theorist about sort of like how data impacts our life. Uh, these are the brothers who um, form Code Act, which I'm going to show some video from. Um, Evelyn Eastman um, developed processing. Nicholas Felton does the annual reports on his life and his data. Wes Scrubs um, might have designed the t-shirts and definitely the posters. Um, Imogen Heap didn't make it actually, she got sick, but um, she was supposed to come. Um, Robert Hodgen, Brian House. Lauren McCarthy is another um, like processing P5JS person. Frieder Nake, I'm going to talk about his talk a little bit. Um, Santiago Ortiz is an artist. Um, Kim Reese also does some visualization and theorizes a little bit. Lillian Schwartz is a really fantastic artist that I'm going to be showing some work from. They're also amazing data visualization pioneers. Is it going in alphabetical order? So every year they have these um, credits that they do and you probably recognized more names than I was able to call out. Um, but it's just like a fantastic lineup. All of these people are um, like have a lot of name recognition, at least for me. And it's just really amazing to be able to see them speak. Um, so the first person that I wanted to talk about was Frieder Nake. Um, and his talk was called, Would You Do It? And he said um, that that's both a question and an answer. Uh, I'm not totally sure what he meant by that. But basically, um, he told the story of his career. Um, he's obviously like an older gentleman. He was one of the first pioneers of digital art and digital media. Um, and he said uh, throughout his career, people would come up to him and ask him, would you do it? And the answer was always yes. And so he um, got to use like one of the first drawing machines to do um, digital art. Uh, and he's become just like a really famous um, digital artist. This is one of his most well-known pieces, which is an homage to um, Klee. And um, he was sort of giving some history of the idea of digital media and digital art. I wasn't able to get my notes up, so I need my, my years here. He claims 1963 is the year that digital media started. Um, and he was showing um, some work by um, George Nice. Um, which is this piece here. So he's got a picture of George up there and then he's got some of his art. This is a, an algorithmic piece um, which was generated using the same algorithm but it's sort of creating these different shapes um, and it was created in the 1960s. I think it's from 64. So Frieder Nake is like this amazing um, artist who's been sort of pioneering digital art since the 1960s and he's still working in teaching which I think is really inspirational. Okay, um, another major highlight for me was seeing Nicholas Felton. Um, how many of you in this room are familiar with Felton or the Feltron reports? Oh, not that many. Okay, that surprises me because we're at the data viz meetup. Um, but so Nicholas Felton is, again, I think an artist and a designer. Um, he was working for Facebook for a little while on the new timeline. So I think people sort of heard about him um, through that. But basically, I know him because he collects data on his life every year and he produces an annual report. And he's been doing this since 2005. Um, and he's produced this book every year. Uh, he actually said at this this year's I.O., he was presenting the 2013 annual report because he collects data throughout the entire year and then he has to analyze it. So he was just finishing it up 
in June when he presented, and it's not actually available yet either. So it takes him a long time to analyze the data. He produces them, um, and he said it's sort of taking up more and more of his life. Every year, it takes longer to analyze the data because he has more questions that he wants to answer. And so he'd always thought of it, I guess, as a 10-year experiment. And so 2015 is going to be the last year that he does it. And then we'll see what he goes on to the next year. So in the background, um, that's a visualization actually from the 2012 annual report. Um, and it's showing some seasonal um, change in something, which I'm not familiar with. So, um, But he was also talking mostly about his 2013 annual report. And so in this report, the question that he wanted to answer was really around his communications. He wanted to know how many people he interacted with, how he interacted with them. Was it different when he was talking to men and women? He was thinking about nonverbal um, interaction cues and whether he knows people's names when he greets them, how he talks to them. That sort of thing. Um, and one of his inspirations, which he was talking about at the conference, is the Umali Awards. It's this um, artist named Renato Umali, who's actually a professor um, at Carleton College in Minnesota. And he produces um, this award show every year. And it has awards like How I Liked My Eggs, My Best Dining Out Experience, or this one, the top 10 D-I-W-I-T-T-Y-P-O-T-S recipient. So um, that's the days in which I talk to you, person other than Sarah, where Sarah is his wife. And so um, Umalia um, creates these um, records of everyone that he speaks to on a daily basis, and then he ranks the people that he talked to the most. And then he has this award show, I think, in his living room. And he actually gives out awards. So he has his friends over, and he says, you won the um, Days in Which I Talked to You Person Other Than Sarah Award. And so Nicholas Felton has been really inspired by um, this work, and he wanted to do something similar but go even more in depth. So he wanted to capture all of his communication for the entire year across all forms of media. Um, and he was sort of joking that what he created was essentially a shopping list for the NSA. So he was collecting his own email um, through Google. You can sort of scrape your email. Of course, the government has that too, we've found out. Um, he was keeping a record of all the SMS messages that he sent. Um, same thing. He kept call records and marked down um, what he was talking about on the phone. He kept all his chat records. And again, I believe this is when he was working for Facebook, so it was mostly Facebook chat. He also meticulously logged every piece of physical mail he got over the entire course of the year. So if it was like a catalog from Crate and Barrel, he wrote that down. If it was a bill, the same thing. And then you see there's like one circle that's not filled in for the government. He was also interested in recording his own conversations that he had with people in the real world. And I think that's probably the hardest one to collect, right? Um, so this one's a little bit hard to see. Again, I'm just sort of pulling images from Twitter because I didn't know I was going to be giving this talk when I was sitting there. Um, but basically, he had this app that let him collect the data pretty easily. And he reported who he was talking to, um, what they were talking about. And there's these different categories. So this one is greeting, nonverbal, and lunch. Um, nonverbal type, it says kiss. Greeting type, hello. Um, pleasantry type, he left blank. And then he does a description, um, Olga's rehearsal schedule, delicious, flat, whole wheat, everything big with white fish and avocado, um, Dropbox camera roll backup, the definition of scrappy, location at home, the time with the whole duration, and then what the duration was. So literally every time he had any interaction with any human, he recorded this. And I think you can sort of imagine what a huge undertaking that would be to record every human interaction you have for an entire year. Um, and so he actually said he thought that this exercise made him stupider. Um, and definitely he said he was apologizing to people because he thought it made him more rude. Because by the end of the day, he would be so sick of recording his data that if you held the door for him, he might just sort of avoid eye contact and not say thank you to you because he didn't want to have to fill it out on the app. <laughs> so the act of recording was changing the data itself. And so that was one of the things that he realized. 
Um, but by collecting all this data, he was able to do sort of interesting analysis. I like this one, the distribution of sent ha ha variations by length. So there's ha, and then there's ha ha or ha. And then you can see the distribution drops off, although there was one with the 11 repetitions. Um, he, oh, he did that multiple times. Um, so I just thought that that was funny. And a lot of the insights that Felton has in these annual reports are that sort of thing, where you look at it and you say, like, that's interesting. That's something I didn't know about the world before. But what does it really tell me? Like, we're at a data visualization meetup, and this is probably the most data visualization example that I'm going to give you in this whole talk. So apologies in advance. Um, but obviously, this isn't a random sample. This is more like a census. And it's not about any, you know, we can't generalize from this population. This is just about Nicholas and about um, what he did um, and what he was saying to people in his communications. So he also produces um, these beautiful printed reports. And you can um, pre-order this year's report that I'm showing you snippets from online right now. And this is a page from it, um, which shows some of the communications. I think these are email records. So he's sort of redacted all of the text out. Um, so you can't actually read it. You can just see that it was an email and what day, you know, sort of the metadata um, and who it was from. So. And again, I don't think you can read it, but a lot of this is from Olga, which is his girlfriend. Um, every year when you look at these reports, you can basically tell who he's dating because there's someone that he just talks to way more or um, you know, places that he went, Olga's apartment will come up more than other places. So you can see things about, about his habits. Um, and one of his points was you know, the NSA is sort of developing these um, models of us, like where our home must be based on our communications. And, and we don't really have access to that data, so you're sort of finding your own data this way. Um, one of the notes at the bottom of that page, which you really, really couldn't read, is if your name is in this annual report, you can email Felton, and he will send you all of the communication you had with him over the course of the year in like this bound book. So this one um, is at a focus level where you can't actually read it, but this is like the, the raw data of all his communications. This is either the full set or maybe um, with Olga, his girlfriend. But he'll send you this bound book of all your communication and what was the nonverbal cue that he used and what was the pleasantry and that kind of thing. Right? So pretty intense. Um, if you're interested in collecting that kind of data on yourself, Nicholas also has this app. It's called Reporter. Um, and I should mention, if you go to this presentation when I send out the link, almost every image is a link to something else. So this is the link to Reporter. Um, and the rest, you know, it's all sources where I got the images from. So Reporter is this app. It's customizable. It lets you collect data. Um, he developed it um, for himself, and then he released it. It's just available for the, the iOS phone, the iPhone. But it's on the App Store. Um, and then you could collect data and, and do your own crazy analysis. Uh, and so. Just a, an aside, this presentation that Nicholas was doing, um, I was assigned as a volunteer to sit and be the one who said, like, you only have five minutes left and give him his microphone and stuff. So I, I've admired his work for a long time. And as soon as I saw him, I went up to him and I introduced myself and I shook his hand. And then as soon as he started talking, I was like, oh no, he probably had to like write that down in some way. Like some like intern came and shook my hand or whatever. Um, but it was interesting observing people interacting with him because so many people were coming up to him and saying, like, this really inspired me to take back my own data and do my own analysis. And I have this blog and I do this thing. And he's, he's really been an inspiration to people. So I think that's really cool. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it's like the quantified self movement, but it's, um, it's a little bit more personal, I think, than a lot of what people are doing with quantified self. It's not as based on sensors. It's more based on um, his own sort of qualitative observations. And then the last thing I have to say about Felton um, is that a lot of people look at his work and they say, well, he is someone who makes data visualizations. And I think that's definitely true. Um, but what I think we miss from it when we just say that is um, that he's really more of an artist. He makes these books. 
And I mean, it's a huge art book. It's on beautiful paper. You buy it, and it's just about his life. He's not a celebrity. He's just some dude. Um, and the data is very beautiful and well presented, but it's really more like a memoir or a self-portrait or something than um, the data visualization that you'd see in a magazine that's trying to communicate some information to you. It's communicating, but he's, he's making more of an artistic point. So I think that's really cool. Um, if you want more Nicholas Felton, um, his website is Feltron, um, and he's Feltron on Twitter and Tumblr and all that. So that's Nicholas Felton. Um, another talk that I really loved on Wednesday was by Adam Harvey, The Electromagnetic Spectrum of Counter Surveillance. So Adam is again sort of an artist and he's also kind of a technologist. He builds things and um, he has this Venn diagram up there which is where his work lies. It's sort of at the intersection of privacy, fashion, and defense. And he was just showing some of his recent projects and talking about his ideas. So um, here's one of them. You might have seen this. There was a piece in the New York Times about it um, within the last year, I think. It's called CV Dazzle, which is for computer vision. That's the CV. And then Dazzle is a type of camouflage um, that the military use to sort of um, get away from different kinds of surveillance. So what he found out is that face recognition algorithms are really, really good. Um, they're much better than you would think that they are, and they're very hard to subvert. And so he started doing research about what you could do to your face to make it so that some camera wouldn't be able to recognize you. And this is one of the examples of the camouflage that you can do. So he's calling out, you want some asymmetry, that's something that um, the algorithms often use is human faces are very symmetrical. So you want something different on either side. Um, you want to block your nose bridge because that's something apparently that the algorithms have found is really good for identifying people is this sort of nose bridge region. And then you want to sort of decontour your eyes. So women often are putting on mascara and um, eyeliner to sort of add more definition to their eyes. And that's actually something that makes it easier for a uh, face recognition algorithm to recognize them as human. Human. So if you're able to sort of decontour your eyes, make them look less um, pronounced, then you can make it harder for the algorithm to detect you. This is just sort of another shot um, showing two different camouflage possibilities. Um, the other one, you can see it's sort of this black and white thing, um, trying to hide your nose, having the asymmetry. Um, and I think, I mean, it's possible that people will start walking around like this. But again, it's sort of more of a thought piece, right? He's saying, I've, I've figured it out. This really works, but I, I'm not really expecting people to do it. Um, and of course, algorithms sort of improve and if everyone started wearing their hair like this I'm sure that the algorithm would be um, updated or would do some machine learning to be able to recognize that kind of face as well. Um, this is another one of his projects. It's called Camo Flash, and the idea is to be sort of anti-paparazzi. So it's this clutch, and it has a bunch of LEDs on it, and when it detects a flash, it sends this super powerful LED blast, and it washes out the whole photograph so you can't see the person. <laughs> and it's, again, it's like an art piece, but he has actually developed it. It really exists, and he's had people go out and try it. Um, and I was just thinking about it because Jeff was going around and taking pictures with the flash and I was like, oh, I should have gotten one of those and then tried it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I guess, um, so Harvey does all this interesting work, um, and you'll see the next one is even more political, but this is the one where he got his first hate mail. And so paparazzo were like emailing him, paparazzi, I guess, um, and saying like, this is how I make my living, how could you do this? And, you know, I, I think it's really like unacceptable that you would make such a, a piece that would be able to subvert the flash like that. So that's one of his pieces. Um, this one is called Off Pocket. This one actually exists. You can buy it. He has um, the Privacy Gift Shop, which is a, a website and also a physical space in New York City where you can go and buy some of these products. Um, and basically, if you put your cell phone in there, it's shielded. It, it's not going to have a communications in or out and all the creepy NSA stuff that we've figured out that they can just like get into your phone however it's all blocked so if you put your phone in this bag um, it's not going to be surveilled and you can buy it for like 30 bucks on on the privacy gift shop 
Um, and this one, I think, is like the most political statement. Um, it's called Stealthware. And this also exists. You can buy this for like $500 in the privacy gift shop. But it's basically these um, pieces of clothing that you can wear, and they prevent you from being um, picked up by sort of infrared or heat detecting cameras. So this is a way um, in the Iraq war or whatever, when we are flying over some area and we're going to try and pick out a target, we're using infrared to to find them, especially at night. And so this one is like more conceptual. This is the hoodie, and you can see it only covers like a, a portion, but he also has a hijab and a burqa, like the full um, garment that's made out of this material, and it shields you. So um, he, he showed video, I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, when they put it on, you really can only see that there's a person because sometimes the heat shield will block something else that has heat, and you'll know it's like an invisibility cloak, but it really exists and you can buy it. Um, and then one of the other things that he was talking about in terms of like what his inspiration is for all these, these pieces is um, it's really cheap to surveil the average person. So if it's some um, major target that we have some reason to really be doing major surveillance on, you could spend like $16,000 a day surveilling them. But for the average person, the government only has to spend and I don't have sources, I'm just quoting him, 19 cents. And so he said it's gotten to the point in terms of data storage and um, the ease of getting data about people that it's just cheaper to surveil everyone and then figure out if you need the data later. And so he's trying to do these efforts to sort of subvert um, and make it harder to surveil people. Uh, on Thursday, we got to see Lillian Schwartz, who is again one of the original pioneers of computer art. And um, so she was born in 1927, and that makes her 87 years old. And she has one of those lives where when you start reading about it, you sort of say, what have I been doing with my life? Because, for example, she was a nurse in World War II. She was in Japan, she got radiation damage, that's what the eye thing is, is she has some like radiation damage, um, and she, she's sort of too weak to travel, so she wasn't able to come from New York to be with us, um, but they showed her films and they wanted her to talk, so they sort of Skyped her in. This is a behind the scenes shot um, from her apartment. I don't think she, I don't think that's her laptop. Um, my advisor, Mark Hansen um, worked with her at Bell Labs, and so he actually was in New York and in her apartment setting up the, the stuff so that she could talk to us. Um, but like I said, she's one of the original computer artists, and she worked at Bell Labs for like longer than I was alive. From 1969 to 2002, she worked there as an artist in residence. Um, and if you're not familiar with Bell Labs, it's where a lot of the like sort of amazing technologies that we use come from. Um, they developed a bunch of pieces of the internet. They um, the Programming language R came out of Bell Labs, essentially. And um, they just had great scientists working there for a number of years. But I think it's really amazing that they, they found an artist and they hired her for like 30 years. They said, you're just our artist in residence and, and we're going to support you to do your work. Um, so she was speaking about her process and she basically said that there were all these scientists at Bell Labs and so she would wander the halls and again it was the 60s it was the computer revolution um, people were starting to think about computer graphics and when she saw something cool that someone was doing then she would sort of ask them about it and maybe do a film based on their scientific graphics so I'm gonna actually show this one um, Okay, we'll try a different way. Um, and this one is based on uh, some work that John Chambers was doing on contour plots. And again, if you don't know who John Chambers is, he is the guy who developed um, S and then R. So let's do this. Okay.
Yeah, so um, what I really love about that is I feel like if you've ever done any kind of plotting of um, multivariate functions, you can sort of see what she's doing there. She's playing with the parameters. You probably recognize some of those, like hyperbolas. Um, and what she said um, in, in, the, in the talk that she was doing is she, would, she didn't really know how to use computers when she started at Bell Labs, um, so she would find these scientists and she would ask them what they were doing, get them to show her how she could modify um, the images that they were producing, and then she would just sit at the computer and modify the image, play with the parameters, see what it did, um, get the image. I think she was getting printouts because I don't think there was such a thing as screenshots. Um, and then, as far as I know, in this one, she was um, hand coloring it. Uh, I don't have all of the information because, again, I wasn't really preparing for this talk um, when I was um, at the festival, but she, a lot of her films, she would do hand coloring of the images after the fact, and then it was like physically taking um, photographs and then and building up the films. So this particular one, again, it was sort of a work inspired by John Chambers, and it was actually shown um, alongside a scientific film that he made using the same kind of data um, in art galleries. So. Um, just really interesting stuff and to think, I mean I think one of the things that was really nice about this year at IO is um, we were sort of going back to the roots of data visualization and digital art. Um, I've been to the festival in the past and it's been very like, well this is the next big thing and it's really humbling to think that people have been doing this for like 50 years. Uh, you think that you're such a hot shot with your computer and like your drawing and like Lillian Schwartz was making these films in like the 1960s. I don't know. So um, again, it's like you gotta figure out what you're doing with your life I guess. Um, and this is another sort of conceptual art piece um, that they did on Friday night, um, which was really amazing. This is Code Act, um, and I don't speak French, so I don't really want to try and pronounce their names, but um, it's, a, it's a pair of brothers, um, and they create these sort of algorithmic art pieces. This one is probably their most well-known piece. It's called Pendulum Choir, and they showed a video of that one as well as some other pieces, and I'm going to show some video as well. Um, you can see in the shot they're, they're sitting there, um, and they've got a translator because they didn't feel like speaking English. They didn't think their English was good enough or something. So. Um, I tried to embed these videos, so we'll see if that works. And I'm not going to show the full thing of each one. Um, see if I can skip ahead. Should be sound for this one. Oh, there we go. So. Um, it's a little bit dark, so I'm not sure if you can see, but for this piece they have um, piles of sand on the ground, and then the two artists have shovels, and there are buckets, and they're shoveling the sand into buckets, and then based on the weight of the sand, it's sort of actuating a sensor, which is making music play. Um, so, I, it's very dystopic, but I, I just think like <laughs> the performance is amazing and then the music is really interesting that it creates. Yeah, so. And obviously the sand filters out of the buckets, so then they have to be refilled. So it's sort of like this futile thing. I just thought that was great. Okay. Oops. That's not what I want to do. I want to go to the next slide. Nope. And then this one, I think this is like actually one of my nightmares. It's, this is like one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen. I don't know if everyone has this response to it, but I just thought it was fabulous. 
So they built this thing, right? It's got these flexible tubes and they're fastened together and then there's motors on the ground. And then the thing in the middle is a speaker and it sort of makes noise according to how things are being bent and um, how much energy is in the system. So the, the motors turn and then the legs or whatever of this thing move around. Um, we'll have to watch it until it gets really horrifying. horrifying. That might have given you the sense of how terrifying that thing is. Um, so again, it's sort of um, an art piece. It's doing some sonification. It's um, sort of algorithmic, or it has like these sort of moving parts, and um, it sort of uh, does does its thing. And the the artists um, are are just having it. Come on, I want the next slide. Interesting. I can step through the whole video. Um, the artists are just sort of having it do its thing, and that's the performance of the piece. So if I can ever get it to go to the next slide, which is apparently one that they've been really known for, which is called Pendulum Choir. Um, and as you can probably see, there's people in this one. Um, and they're trained opera singers, and then they're standing on these platforms, and there's this hydraulic system um, beneath them. And what was interesting about hearing the artists talk about this is that they were hoping that by, well, maybe I should show it to you, the people are going to move. Um, and they were hoping that by moving them, their voices would be sort of modulated, like the, the stress or the, the surprise of being moved would, would cause them to have a vocal reaction to it. And it turns out that trained opera singers don't have that response. <laughs> they can sing in any position. And so the brothers were like, this was kind of a failure. And then we had to figure out how to save it. Um, but, I mean, it's, again, very otherworldly and... pretty long, but um, I really encourage you to check out their website um, because they also have 
um, just crazy documentation about all the research that they do about all the technology and about the way that the sounds are going to work. Um, they have their own sort of new musical notation for how the person's body should be moving and what sound they should be making. So they sort of wrote this whole symphony or whatever that the guys are singing and choreographed the movement and built those crazy hydraulic things, um, which after seeing that terrifying thing moving around, I don't think I would be strapped into one of those. <laughs> but um, these guys are very trusting. Um, so I think I didn't know how long this was going to take me. And so I had backloaded some slides. Oh, well, maybe I have one more here. Let's see what it is. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think I have enough time that I can do a couple more, just talk about a few more little things, if I can get this to get bigger. Maybe not. So I called this even more awesomeness, in case I had some time to talk about some more awesome things. Um, so this was one talk that I actually wasn't able to go see, um, but I love Mike Bostock, and he is just like such an amazing um, sort of designer of tools and then also designer of visualizations. He's the D3 guy. So he gave a talk on visualizing algorithms and he was sort of showing how um, sampling, different kinds of sampling could be used and um, demonstrating on uh, image processing of the image of um, this painting. Um, and what's really nice is he actually made this into a page on his website. So if you wanted to go look and see all of the algorithms. There are live demos on the site written in D3, so you can watch the algorithms take place and then read his explanation. I heard that that talk was amazing, though. Um, one of my favorite talks was actually Kate Crawford, who was talking about big data anxieties. Uh, and Kate um, works at Microsoft, I believe, and she sort of thinks about the implications of big data. And she was making this comparison, which was amazing, um, between the surveillance um, sort of state that we live in, where we're all like, we know data is being collected about us, and we're trying to blend into the data with the um, sort of fashion report um, that came out this year that was about norm core as the new way that people are dressing in terms of like really high fashion, the cargo shorts, um, the like really bad shoes, that kind of thing. Um, people are sort of in fashion mimicking what we're trying to do with data. Like we don't want to um, stand out in the data and then uh, it's sort of being reflected in fashion. So she had this amazing um, sort of parallel that she was making between um, the NSA's um, squeaky dolphin PowerPoint presentation deck and then uh, I wish I could remember the name of the fashion house where they do this enormous book of like this is the trend of the year and the trend was Normcore. So that was really great. Um, Kim Reese, who does um, great data visualizations, actually sort of departed from her usual trend of showing her visualization. And she was talking more about the future of data and what um, data is going to be able to do and the implication that that's going to have on our life. And she was talking about this um, article called The Rise of the Data Natives, which I don't think she actually wrote, but um, it really played into the point that she was making about how um, now people like children who've grown up in this um, sort of data rich environment are going to expect things to respond to them via data. They're going to expect that the refrigerator is going to tell them what they might want to eat or um, you know, sort of do that kind of prediction. Um, in the same way that we have kids who are now sort of digital natives and you see those toddlers pinching and, and zooming on the iPad, they have those interactions really young. People are going to be um, sort of more embedded in with data. Um, we also had like the third, the third in the trifecta of super <laughs> old school digital artists. We had Roman Verostko, who's um, from Minneapolis, and he was talking about algorithmic leverage. And he also has like this amazing story. Um, one of his stories started out when I was in the monastery in the 1960s, and apparently he was a monk for a number of years. And he did like this big art piece for the monastery that he was showing. Um, he has um, this uh, piece that sort of generates little um, truisms about life. Um, the e explicit crash infrequently reads, praise plaintively only when crash rubs. So he was demonstrating some of his digital art. 
Um, this is a, a version of the Mona Lisa where each cell is a numeral and the sort of denser numerals are being used for the denser parts of the piece. Um, we also saw Santiago Ortiz speak. This was another one that I thought was just like really inspirational for me personally, um, but I wasn't sure how generally interesting it was going to be. He was talking about um, six months of his life. I guess he um, had had a different sort of career path in the past and then realized that he really wanted to work with data and work directly with clients, and he didn't have any experience doing that. So he quit his job. He took six months. He just planned to spend down all his savings, and he did these amazing projects. So this is just one of them. Um, this is a typeface where the size of the number or like the, the weight um, corresponds to the number itself. Um, so there's sort of like data within the data. Um, and he had all sorts of other beautiful pieces that he did during the six months. And then a great story at the end where he actually is like a data visualization scientist now um, and achieved his goal. So that was, that was really inspiring. Um, and maybe I'll end on this. So this is um, Robert Hodgen, who is um, really involved with doing digital um, simulations and doing great graphics rendering. And so um, he was talking about some of his projects. Um, and I'm just going to try and figure out how to queue up him talking about creative coding. Um, 617, so let's go there. Come on. And then I'll be done. So if you want to go with me with a little thought experiment, um, relax, be comfortable, maybe you can bring the house light down a little bit for this part. So imagine you are a painter. You paint some beautiful landscapes of light and light. Your specialty is sunrise over a pond with all the other water that they vibrant and it's all blue. You've been painting these landscapes for years. You've honed your technique. You don't even have to think about how to paint or what colors to choose. It's just that easy. You have a morning ritual. You wake up, pour a cup of coffee, grab your supplies, and head down to the pond, you know, the one by the old Hendrick house. The light is beaming through. Begin with some phthalate blue, some violet, and a little green gray. And if you're counted, like, you mix out a gradient of hues that capture this essence of light and interplay with the morning mist that surrounds you. You touch a brush and pat it, and you steal away some of the violets. You extend your reach, and as you touch the tip of the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so that's his interpretation of creative coding. Um, I don't know if you guys work with work with code the way that I do, but I just I loved that um, all the build up and then the the horrible gesture appears and he won't let you paint anymore until you solve a series of riddles. Um, so as you noticed, I was just showing you a video of that talk. And actually, every talk at IO is recorded, and they put the videos up online. The first three are up. So that was one. Um, and Frieder Nake's talk just went up online today, too. That was the um, would you do it. 
and um, you can follow them on Vimeo. I have a link. Um, you can go to iofestival.com and sign up for their mailing list if you feel like you want to um, try and get some of those coveted tickets for IO 2015. You can follow them on Twitter. I swear they're not paying me to say this. Um, and then these are the, the people whose tweets I appropriated for my images. So thanks to them. Thanks.